Hi, thank you for joining us. This is Rise Phoenix Rise, and I am Tracy Carano Jones, the founder of Rise Phoenix Rise. Rise Phoenix Rise is an animal assisted wellness program that marries the evidence based practices of peer support and animal assisted therapy. Today, we have a wonderful host of people to help us understand what the benefits are of peer support in animal assisted therapy. So I'd like to go down the, um, the panel and have everyone introduce themselves so we get to know them each a little bit better. Hi, I'm Beth Grayson. I um, am a social worker in my full-time job um, doing work with families who provide foster care. And um, also, I'm a volunteer with the Alliance for Therapy Dogs, and so part of a pet therapy team for the last five years or so. Um, my name is Jackie Ashley, and I am a somatic psychotherapist, an equine facilitated psychotherapist. My business is Wild at Heart um, Therapy, and I work with horses and people out in nature with uh, creative arts therapies and body-based work with um, trauma. Hi, my name is Kerry Carner, and I'm the peer support supervisor for Colorado Mental Wellness Network. Um, I've been a peer support professional for the last 12, 13 years, um, and in a lead role and a supervisory and training role as well. Hello, my name is JJ Aragon. Um, I'm currently getting ready to train as a peer support uh, professional. And uh, my peer support experiences include, I'm a sponsor in a 12-step program. Um, I am a leader in our National Federation of the Blind of Greeley. Um, and I have a master's work in uh, counseling and uh, mental health, excuse me, mental, clinical mental health counseling. That's my background. Hi, I'm Michael Oberly. I am a canine partner energy coach, author and energy I'd like to take this time to thank everyone for joining us, both online and in studio. Um, we also have um, Quinn, who's helping us with the technology piece of this. Um, so the format of today is I'm just going to ask some random questions, well, they're not random, but I'm going to randomize the questions, and it's going to be in a popcorn type uh, style, so I'm going to just ask questions um, from both our animal experts and our peer support experts um, to see how we can integrate both peer support and animal assisted therapy to better help our community, um, especially in these times when um, we have found ourselves more isolated and um, having difficulties um, finding community. So um, the first question I'd like to um, ask Carrie. Um, Carrie, what drove you to pursue a career as a peer sports professional? Good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I'm a person who was very fortunate to get into recovery very young. And after 20 years, I ended up falling out of recovery and becoming homeless again. Um, struggled to get back into recovery from both substance misuse and mental health, emotional health stuff. And when I got back into recovery, I had to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I had a past career in the IT business for 20 years, and yet that wasn't my love anymore. What did I do for free and for fun? I went to Denver Health, the adult psych ward. You know, I'm also part of a recovery group. Um, and so it's like, how can I be helpful to people with backgrounds similar to mine? And I will just, this is one of my taglines that I use. I am so blessed and so lucky. I happen to think that those of us that are peer support professionals have the best jobs in the world. Mm. 
because many of the things that would disqualify us from most jobs, they're the things that qualify us for this one. If I didn't have lived experience with substance use, trauma, homelessness, co-occurring stuff, I wouldn't be able to do this job and, and develop a genuine connection with people. So that's, that's actually why I got into this 13 years ago. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you. Okay. My next question is from Michael. Michael, how did you become involved with animal assisted activities? <laughs> Great question. Um, I've had dogs most of my life. Um, the first dog I had when I was a kid basically kept me from committing suicide. Um, I didn't realize until later uh, the effect that he actually had on me after uh, some major family trauma. And years and years later, I had another uh, big death in my family, and that was for my older brother. And after that happened, I was actually able to grieve all these amazing things. And I had this incredible dog there with me who actually helped me heal and helped others around me heal during this event. And it just opened me up to the possibilities. So I started training every energy healing modality I could find and working with other dogs and horses. And, um, decided I wanted to help other men uh, learn to create a better life for themselves. Thank you, Michael. It's amazing what you do. Thank you. So, um, JJ, the question goes to you. What experiences have you had in a leadership role? Thank you, Tracy. Um, so, um, my leadership journey, I think, began when I joined the National Federation of the Blind um, like eight years ago when I was 21. Um, I sort of just got thrown into it. <laughs> we, uh, we needed a chapter in Fort Collins, and the National Federation of the Blind does, um, we're an advocacy and social group uh, supporting blind people nationally. I, my work is in Colorado. And um, they needed a chapter in, in Fort Collins, and they just said, you know, would you want to join? And I was like, okay. I, I wasn't really sure what I was getting myself into. Um, so I have, um, uh, I've been, uh, held several office positions, and right now I'm president of the Greeley chapter. And so from there, um, in that area, I've learned about, uh, you know, leading a group of people to do uh, different advocacy work, political work, social work. Um, and that's that's been a def definitely a new world for me. Um, I'm I'm more about emotions and, and human connections. So, um, and then when I joined um, my 12-step group uh, three years ago, it'll be three years in recovery for me in February. Um, I uh, about a year in, I started sponsoring, um, and then I started my own uh, meeting uh, a year ago. And in both, um, I've really been able to, you know, as, as a, a leader more or less to my sponsees, um, I've really been able to develop my one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection uh, with, you know, each sponsee and really tailor, you know, how, how we work the steps, uh, the 12 steps, and um, learning how to make, uh, tailor to individuals in that area. And then with the meeting, um, I've really learned a lot about balancing what what my vision is for, you know, this particular meeting and still meeting, you know, the needs of, of those in the group. And that's that's been a, a beautiful journey. And I've been able to bring, I think I'm most proud of my leadership in that group. Um, I've been able to bring, you know, so many together from around the world and and we get to, you know, share in our recovery and, and just, and, and grow together. Um, and I also, did some worksheets for that group. So, um, so when I think in those uh, what's that, two areas, three areas, um, I really, I really developed as a leader in in several different ways. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's amazing how you can take leadership roles from one area and bleed it over into other areas of your life. How your life experiences. Can, can be integrated and you can take experiences from like the National Federation of the Blind and, and help it um, grow your experiences in recovery work. 
So I think that's beautiful. Thank you, JJ. Jackie, what are some benefits of animal-assisted activities on the human-animal bond? Well, um, most all of my work is with horses. So um, sort of like Michael, I always say that when I grew up, my horse saved my emotional life. Um, so how animals, particularly horses, um, help uh, people recover or heal is, I always say in the presence of a horse, you become embodied. I mean, they're large, often thousand pound animals, um, but they're prey animals, not predators. So they have a keen sense of um, their surroundings and their, their capacity to be safe and they're connected to each other as, um, as animals in a herd. So when folks come in their presence, it's like they have to kind of wake up, so to speak. You know, they're kind of like, wow, okay, my feet are on the ground. I'm looking at this big animal. So it helps naturally for people to get out of their, their thoughts, their, their mind, their perseverating worries and fears and sadness and all that, and they come into the present moment. And being a therapist um, for many decades now, um, I've been lucky I haven't had to work a lot in an office. So, um, and I've found that, you know, being outside in nature, I always say Mother Nature can hold anything, any trauma, any pain, any grief. Uh, and then in the presence of these amazing animals, the horse, um, you're just brought into the present moment. Um, horses are beautiful, they're big, they're graceful, they sort of embody a lot of our longing of how we would like to be in the world. Um, so it's, it's a, natural, uh, a natural capacity to be brought in the present moment out of our perseverating thoughts and pain and all that. And in relationship with a, an animal, not a human, <laughs> um, because a lot, for a lot of the folks that I work with, that, that capacity to feel safe and to trust uh, and to be comfortable with other humans has been, you know, damaged. But a horse or an, any other animal, you know, they don't intentionally try to hurt you. <laughs> they don't judge you. They don't laugh at you. They don't care what you look like, what you're dressed as, your economic, you know, they are just there totally for you. And that's foundationally healing. Yeah, yeah. It's like non-judgmental oh, yeah. mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Present moment. Yep. Yeah. They are like the the kings and queens of mindfulness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. Get them little crowns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Beth, for you, I have two questions. So. First, what kind of training do animals need to be a therapy animal? Second, what kind of training do handlers need to work therapy animals? So I, I can only speak to dogs because that's my experience is, is um, being a handler or a golden retriever. Um, and what she needed, first and foremost, is to be um, composed, polite, non-aggressive, um, calming, um, not easily startled um, by anything. And um, my dog in particular came to us as a rescue, but she was two and she was just came with those things already embodied within her. <laughs> it wasn't anything I did, but she showed up that way. And after I had had her for about three years, I thought, I don't know what this pet therapy thing is, but I think she can do it because she has this effect on people. And I would go out in public and people were just drawn to her and drawn to her gentle nature. And I thought there was a way that maybe we could manifest this and help others. So um, we began a training together to become a pet therapy team. And so um, she had the qualities and I thought I could probably learn the qualities of how to handle her. So the, the training really involves um, 
understanding the types of environments you might be in and how to best um, work within those environments to make people comfortable. The do's and don'ts of things, like in our, for example, my dog's seven pounds, so she's not going to be permitted to be jumping on furniture, jumping on people's beds in a, like a hospital situation, or she's not a lap dog, so we're not going to be doing her a lap, um, hopefully. So um, there are just certain things that are, that are that are expected, and as the handler, you are supposed to make sure that that all stays in line, um, making sure she's on the leash, um, making sure that if there was an incident, it's automatically recorded to a supervisor, for example, if she met at somebody, which she never would, but if she did, that you're recording those things. So the handler is always very aware of their dog, and they're aware of how their dog is doing. Is she stressed? Are her ears back? You know, is she seeing mm -hmm. nervous? Is she panting? We don't want it to be a stressful experience for her, so we're always trying to be really in tune with our dog and be giving her positive, in my case, her positive reinforcement. Um, so really the handler's job is more so to present the vehicle, which is the dog, as the, um, as kind of the vehicle for communicating with whoever might need her um, calming nature and, and her therapy. So I sort of saw myself as more the observer and her as more the, the link between and, and the person who might her. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, she is amazing, and as Tracy knows, um, unfortunately, very, very suddenly she passed away from the oh, oh, yeah. So, she's so so. really a guest. One mm. in a million. Tracy knows her. Yeah. 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 And, and it's been tough, but I, I, I feel like I have another dog in my future <laughs> at some point, too. Thank you so much for your service yeah. and for her. Yeah. She was a gift. Yeah. Jesse, you can stay. <laughs> Jesse's bowing to her. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. So this is a question for all of you now that you've all answered one question. Do you see value in combining peer support with animal assisted activities? Who wants to go first? I'll jump in because I know it works. Okay. <laughs> um, because for maybe a decade, um, I worked with mental health partners and um, they had a peer support program and that peer support person was the person who actually brought um, a group of people um, out to see the horses every Thursday for two and a half hours. Um, and, you know, without, without Steve, folks couldn't have gotten there. I mean, it was a big ordeal. I mean, I know he got up the crack of dawn, you know, drove to, I think, from Boulder to Longmont to get the van and then, you know, picked everybody up and got them in the van and brought them to the barn and, you know, did all the notes and for Medicaid and did all the paperwork so that um, the program could be, uh, you know, the program could run. So without a peer support specialist, we don't have it anymore because the um, mental health partners um, cut the program. And so it kind of fell apart because folks can't, you know, a lot of folks can't drive. Um, or if they can, they don't have a car. And, you know, just to get to the group, I mean, one person took a bus from Boulder to Longmont, met folks at uh, Sherman Center, I think, and then got there. So, you know, without peer support specialist, and, and again, you know, he, he, he'd been through everything you all have talked about to the point where, you know, now he was um, being of service and he loved it. So. It's a, in some ways, it's essential, um, and it's an essential part of being able to bring, at least in my world, um, get people uh, to the barn um, and to get the funding necessary for the groups to, to work. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Thank you for talking about experience. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I'll jump in for just a moment as someone with zero professional experience, <clears throat> but I can tell you that, at least in my case, um, my now ex-wife and I had a retired racing greyhound, and I, like you, Michael, give Hero, the retired racing greyhound, a lot of credit for helping keep me alive when sometimes I didn't want to. Was also very helpful in when I was having trouble taking care of myself, when I was too overwhelmed, somehow in my head, Hero had to get walked every day. Exactly. So it was, mm -hmm. even if it was, I'm just going to soak my head in the sink and then put a hat on and take the dog for a walk. When we had a backyard with doggy doors, there was no action. But in my mind, mm -hmm. I think that using, um, animal assisted therapy in combination with peer support professionals for some people is a natural match. It's not going to be for everybody. Right. Not for every peer support professional, not for every person that we're privileged to serve. But when there's the match, I could see there being... Magic. Yeah, magic. <laughs> That's the right way to put it. That's not an evidence-based practice though. <laughs> Neither is kindness and compassion. So, oh, wait. Oh, um, I know about that. Yeah, I, no, I, <laughs> I think that's why we call it trauma-informed care. Um, <laughs> if you can find the right people with the right animals, with the right population, people can feel safe with animals. You know, you mentioned about dogs, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, we were going to do that with Hero, but he ended up getting bone cancer, mm. and so that curtailed it. Um, but they don't care what you look like. They don't care what you do for a living. They don't care how much money you make. You feed them, you give them a little love, and you get unconditional love back. Best deal in town. <laughs> so people that can connect with animals that way, it can also form a bond between the peer supporter and the person they're privileged to serve. Mm -hmm. So they can assist us in allowing us to practice our craft in a more skillful way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terry, you speak to um, the fact that everyone has a different path, a different journey, a mm -hmm. different way to recover. Yeah. And so the more options, the better. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I never want to be about us versus them. I don't think peer supporters replace anything. I think they add value to other relationships as part of the support team. They're an adjunct. Yeah. Everyone works together. It's Everyone. collaborative. The more ingredients you put on a pizza, the better it tastes. Exactly. <laughs> more, more ingredients. Exactly. Yep. So if we can assist and translate and be open to people's multiple paths, to help them find their path and be supportive. That's why we're peer supporters. Um, we may be in leadership roles in some way, but we're actually, with the people we're privileged to serve, we don't lead. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. We walk beside. Exactly. And yes. we ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? I wanna um, actually grab that thread that Carrie just put out. Um, and I think uh, everyone's talked about this. Um, unconditional love or unconditional positive regard um, is, uh, you know, in, in all my areas, um, you know, in, in the master's work, in the 12-step work, we, we really talk about that unconditional love or unconditional positive regard, unconditional friendship. And what it really boils down to is no matter what I do, I know, and, and my experience with animals is with my cat, um, with my partner's guide dog, um, with my, uh, uh, when I when I was a kid and my dad left, I had two cats uh, right after that. And so, um, anyway, so coming back to the unconditional, uh, unconditional um, feeling, I'm just gonna umbrella that. Um, what it really boils down to is, no matter what I do, no matter if my grades are up, no matter if I'm, if I don't wanna get out of bed, no matter what, 
it is I'm doing, my animals are going to love me no matter what. And, and that unconditional feeling is so, so, it's such a cornerstone in any recovery work, um, in any work with trauma. And I can say, you know, from my own trauma, my own childhood trauma, it's still hard for me to, to let unconditional love in. And it's still, you know, sometimes it's still hard for me to believe in it. And so with working with animals that just naturally do it, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to learn about it. They don't have to, you know, <laughs> they got it made already. I think with, um, with peer support and, and animals, um, giving, you know, in 12-step in, in we call it experience, strength, and hope. It truly is experience, strength, and hope. You have the, the experience of being unconditionally loved by an animal and the strength of that and the hope that says, okay, unconditional love is possible and I can be worthy of it. I think I, I, that's where I see that, that connection happening between peer support and, um, and, and working with animals is, is that experience, strength, and hope. Thank you, Jacob. That was beautiful. Anyone else? You know, there, there seems to be sometimes a limitation in regards to the human connection. Like, we can, we can do so much to connect with each other, but when I brought a dog into that scenario, especially doing a lot of hospice work with my dog, um, sometimes there are no words, and you bring in this, this animal, and the healing and calming effect that she could have in these, these very distressing and very sad instances where maybe someone is just passed away and the family is there. And, and there are really no words to be spoken, but when she would lay down on her back, you know, mm -hmm. and the family would form a circle around her and scratch her belly, mm -hmm. and people would start to share, you know, memories of that person. Or um, it, it was this, this remarkable vehicle that, that if I was just there by myself, um, trying to help this family, it wouldn't have had the same effect. And so there is this sort of unspeakable power that animals seem to, to bring. And um, it, it's really a, a beautiful thing, and I um, am so glad that I've been able to, to have that experience as someone who, who was gifted with a dog like that, that could have that kind of healing power and impact on people. It, it truly is I've called that universal um, beneficial presence. Yeah, you don't even, they don't even have to do anything. <laughs> Just being there is a beneficial mm. presence. Yep. And especially, it's okay to be silent in certain situations. Absolutely. And it's much easier when you have that wonderful beneficial yes. presence yes. there. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they always will offer it no matter what. Yep. They're, they're always going to be there with it. Well, there is scientific evidence that shows that just being with animals raises your good feel-good hormone, oxytocin, and lowers your stress hormone, cortisol. So it is like a natural medication, mm -hmm. which is cheaper than buying it from <laughs> pharmaceuticals. And no bad side effects. And no bad side effects. <laughs> and it lowers your blood pressure, lowers your heart rate. I mean, there's all kinds of um, medical documentation. Just look it up in the scientific journals. <laughs> you know, if anybody has seen Shrek, uh, Shrek 2 with Puss in Boots, that little <laughs> happy cat yeah, face, yeah. That, that, that is based in reality. That, <laughs> that, that releases the oxytocin. And, it's, <laughs> and you know, like I said my partner's dog, oh my gosh, her oxytocin eyes. Uh, oxytocin eyes. <laughs> I call them the oxytocin eyes. <laughs> That's like, um, what, what is that song <laughs> about blue eyes or? Or, I don't know, never mind. <laughs> There's a Oxy lot of songs about blue eyes. But <laughs> Oxytocin eyes, we should make a song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did anyone else want to chime in on um, the animal assisted and peer support? Um, yeah, I'll chime in real quick. So I, I think for a lot of folks, they don't understand that there are other ways to gain access to these types of services. And um, whether it's a companion animal that they may already have at home, 
or in a more professional setting. There's, there's things out there for you. Do you want to speak I'm on that? And, um, and, and you just got to look and start asking. Um, yeah, animals bring something that we still can't even quantify. We, we like to you know, say, look at the medical literature, look at the journals and the scientific data, and the Human Animal Bond Research Institute, Institute for Animal Human Connection. People are doing great stuff, but there's more. It's deeper. Why, why do you smile when you look at a dog? That's an instant change in your energy. Instantaneous. You didn't have to do a thing. So uh, why stop there? If you don't have an animal, your neighbor has an animal, say, hey, can I pet your dog? There's other ways. You can also volunteer at the shelters. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. They are always looking for volunteers. Absolutely. Yep. You can go, um, go to the dog parks. And just watch the dogs. You just watch yeah. the dogs. Yeah. You, you can go. Um, you can go to, like the barns and help out, like cleaning stalls. Yeah, from Muxham Stables. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. They're always looking for help, aren't they? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you can go to, like, uh, petting zoos. <laughs> what else? What are, are some other options? Anyone? Yeah. Go to the park. Watch the squirrels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Count the birds. Mm-hmm. You know, get mindful. Yeah. That's a meditation in its own. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You don't have to sit on a pillow staring at the candle. <laughs> yeah. Even just, you know, taking a walk around the neighborhood. I mean, people usually have dogs out, you know, and so. And there are, there are people who are at home who have animals who may not be able to get out and walk their animals. Who, there are neighbors in your community mm -hmm. who um, are stuck at home. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they hurt themselves. Maybe they're elderly. They need help, and and you can you can um, volunteer to walk their dog. Yeah. I will be the millennial here and say there's. I know it's not the real thing, but there's also YouTube videos. You know, in terms of watching. Oh the animals. Yeah. yeah. So that's you know, if if you're at home, unable to really access a, a dog, the next best thing is to you know do a video. Mm -hmm. Watch yeah. a video. This is true, and even fish. Just watch yeah. them. Yeah. That's why they have them in doctor's offices. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because exactly. they calm people down. Like, oh. So here's another question for everyone. What are some activities that might happen at an animal-assisted therapy um, session? Either with horses or with dogs. Or, you know, Rise Phoenix Rise, um, when we were in Virginia, we used to have cat chat. <laughs> we, we would go to a cat cafe and just sit there while the cats would roam around. Mm -hmm. Because some people have affinity to cats. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm one of them. Yeah, JJ likes cats. Mm -hmm. yep, so it. what are some activities that could happen? I'll go. Okay. Um, there's a special forces operator that I work with. He's retired from the military 20 years in. He's seen and done things I can't even imagine. But in the presence of his dog, um, can access parts of himself that he would never let his wife, his parents, his friends see. And he can he can break into these parts of himself and and cry and heal. And I, when his, his last dog died, I held this guy. I don't know how long. He just cried in my arms. <coughs> Excuse me. And I mean, this is a guy who could take you out with his pinky, right? And he's he's just, just an amazing, tough man. And this dog access parts of him mm. that, that no one else ever could. No therapist ever got through, he wouldn't allow it. None of his family members could get through, he wouldn't allow it. Like the dog did. Mm. So there's there's a key, there's an access. And I, Jack, I know you know this so well, it's going to be better. They have a different key to us. We're actually holding it, but they help us find it. Mm. Mm. And one of the the powerful things about the work that I do is I have a particular passion for doing groups of people, um, though I do one-on-one. -on -one, but the group experience with a horse, and I, I do um, and have for over a decade now worked with um, groups of women with um, sexual trauma. And one of the activities that is so wonderful is when two women um, are with one horse and grooming the horse. And then they just begin to talk, you know. 
Um, and, it, and it's a, a safe way to talk. You don't have to like look at somebody yeah. and you're moving, you know, as a somatic therapist, movement is life. And, you know, you're doing this repetitive movement. You're connected to your body. There's another human there and humans are pretty scary for people who have been um, traumatized. You know, so the activity of, of having this thousand pound, warm, soft, beautiful, strong, being <laughs> that you are um, giving comfort to by brushing because the horses usually love it otherwise they wouldn't yep. just stand there and talking to each other um, is one of the most powerful experiences um, in my groups uh, I just had someone talking to me about it yesterday yeah that's great mm. So just thinking back about, like, so we've talked a lot about the animal experience. Um, let's look a little bit more about the peer support professional. Carrie, can you tell us a little bit about how someone would become a peer support specialist? Okay. Like the certification process. Tracy, I apologize. Sure. Could I answer the, the um, Oh, yeah, absolutely. The activity? Question? Absolutely. <laughs> um, one thing I was going to point out, too, is um, play. Playing with animals is so... Mm -hmm. mm. So my cat, um, <laughs> well, let me, let me back up. In uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics, the 12-step program, we do a lot of inner child work. And that involves, you know, as a child going through trauma, I, I, I shut my playful, joyful, you know, spontaneous child away. And so getting back in touch with, with my inner child, my inner children, um, is, is, has been a big piece of recovery. And so when my cat, starts meowing at me and she wants her, um, she has no interest in cat toys, she wants ribbons and <laughs> <laughs> packing straps. And, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when she comes to me and, and you know, she, she wants to play, I just get to lose myself and you know, just waving that ribbon around, trying new things. If I move it this way, what's she gonna do? And, and watching her jump and, and, just, and just play and getting in touch and that helps me get in touch with the, the spontaneous you know, happy-go-lucky little girl that, that went into hiding as a child. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, play is definitely so important to me. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you for interrupting me. That's huge. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that was important. Thank you. So I'm just going to say, JJ, play and fun mm -hmm. is vastly underrated. Mm -hmm. yep. And especially as someone in recovery from a variety of things, co-occurring disorders. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to have fun again is huge. Um, I can remember one night looking out my window and I, I was back in recovery a couple of years and um, it was winter, it was snowing, and the snow was sparkling on the trees with the lights and I'm going, oh my God. And then my unskillful adult stepped in and said, Carrie, it's just light on snow. What's the big deal? And I wanted to smack that adult. Yep. <laughs> yep. Because I think having fun, and that's especially true with recovery in general. If everybody thinks that, oh, I'm going to be in recovery, my life is over, I'll be dull, glum, and boring. I'll be sad all the time sad all the time. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to like me. It's like, no, the world opens up. I've done way more things that I can remember in my life in recovery than prior to getting into recovery. Yep. So, and you had the question about how do you become a peer support professional? Yes, the certification okay. process. So, um, Colorado Mental Wellness Network, um, actually does training for peer support professionals um, and we're one of the approved trainers for the state certification. Um, it's a three-week course. Um, I don't know all the specifics. When I got into this, it didn't exist. Um, my training was actually two full semesters at Denver Community College with someone. But we have a very well-designed, both a screening process and training process that includes a lot of role plays and actually real world experience. So there is a misconception, we believe, that 
if you're in recovery, you're automatically going to be a wonderful peer support professional. And I can tell you that's not the case. Some people are so tied to a single path of recovery. This worked for me, so it must work for you. And a peer support professional needs to be open to a variety of paths. The other thing that, that's really important to know is some people think they want to get into it because they're going to tell their story. And that's actually not what a peer support professional does. Um, we, we use our lived experience and we share the appropriate bit at the appropriate time with the appropriate person for the appropriate reason. And that is really critical. We learn to ask, we have to have some respectful curiosity about the people mm -hmm. that we serve. So it's, it's having lived experience, it's combining that with really good state-of-the-art training, and then going into a work environment that's actually prepared to have a peer support professional. Not just, we got money on a grant and it says we need to hire a peer supporter. Right. Um, but there are lots of things that have to be in place. The other thing that's important for people that want to be peer support professionals to realize is that this is a profession, it's a job with a career path. Mm. You can start as a peer support professional, go to a peer support lead, go to a peer support supervisor, Eventually, we plan on taking over the world. Oh, God, I said that out loud. Didn't <laughs> I? Um, secrets pinky, out. Pinky yeah, in the brain. Secrets out. Yeah, pinky <laughs> in the brain. Huh. Um, <laughs> and it's generally, it's genuinely wanting to be supportive of someone without thinking we're going to fix them, we're going to make them better. I don't have that much power. Self determination. It is, we believe in self determination. Mm -hmm. So being in touch with harm reduction, a housing first philosophy with people. Um, and then this is the other passion of my life because it was part of my recovery when I look back and that's um, having a genuinely trauma informed attitude toward the people we're privileged to serve. So are we gonna be able to create a safe environment for people? Are we gonna be willing to build trust over time are we gonna offer genuine choice in a collaborative relationship so that they feel empowered to walk their path? Right. Those are the things that Colorado Mental Wellness Network really focuses on during training and during the practical application of that training. So I don't know if that answered what you it wanted, did. but. It did, thank you. I'm very excited now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so, um, let's see. Michael, what do you, what are some places that you've worked with people with your dogs? Like some, some environments. Oh, yeah, outside. <laughs> <laughs> if at all possible. Um, obviously weather dependent. Um, I love water. Ooh. And running water seems to be particularly because no matter what, the river's still running. So it, it provides a sense of um, constant energy, and it's, it's very calming. A lot of people um, just love the sound of running water. People have little fountains in their mm -hmm. homes or, or meditate to, to an app with the sound of running water. And um, being in nature by itself is, is huge, but being near a body of water that's moving is, uh, seems to be particularly powerful. What, what do you think about the water? What, 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 what is the energy force that makes the water so powerful? Um, water's completely malleable. Constantly yeah. shifting, changing, yeah. doesn't matter. The temperature, it's still water. Yeah. We call it ice, but it's still water. Yeah, yeah and, and if you think about it, that's where we come from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing exists without it, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful and it's soft at the same time. It can be hard. Wow, that's a great image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Yeah. 
Beth, um, let me see what can I ask you. Um, how did you become, oh, I already asked that one. Um, can you differentiate the difference between a pet, an emotional support animal, a therapy animal, and a service animal? No, <laughs> runs the whole gamut. I, mean, I, I thought I, you were going to say runs the household. Well, runs the well, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, I have always, until Heidi, my my um, therapy dog, have had very unruly animals, dogs in particular, who have very poor boundaries and <laughs> who just got into everything, ate everything, <laughs> he ruled the house, but not in the best way. And and so a pet is, is um, generally doesn't have, or there aren't necessary definitions around behavior. It's, it, your pet can, can, can act many, many different ways. When we're going into talking more about a service animal, for example, um, my understanding is a service animal is specifically trained to help somebody with a disability. And, and this, this animal is approved by the ADA and, um, you know, can help someone who is um, hearing or vision impaired, um, PTSD, you know, just a, a lot of different conditions can travel with this person, can come into to businesses and fly on airplanes, has very special distinction this way, or this is my understanding, you can speak more to this. Um, emotional support animal um, is not an animal that's been approved by the ADA, but is, is there to provide um, men mental health support to someone who may be struggling with a diagnosis. Um, usually this is something prescribed by a mental health professional um, and provides that little bit of emotional support for somebody who has experienced trauma, who has experienced anxiety or depression, for example. Um, and then a therapy dog, um, there needs to be specific training around, um, you know, for both the handler and the dog and the team together. And this is usually done through um, an accredited organization like the Alliance of Therapy Dogs, Pet Partners is another one, um, where you actually get that certification and that distinction to go into schools, to hospitals, um, mm -hmm. to support groups, to help. Um, as another vehicle for providing assistance and, and therapy to people. Um, so, so there are different distinctions for each of those um, different categories. Some of it is, is what it takes to become certified. Um, some of it is, um, like I said, the ADA is, is only specific to service animals. So um, that's kind of the way I understand the distinction. Very good. Very well done. Yeah. Yay. Um, so the the very fine point is a service animal can only be a dog or a pony, um, and they um, are specific to one person, and that person has to have a diagnosed disability, and that dog or a pony has to mitigate that disability, and that is and they are the only animals that are protected under the ADA, hmm. and they. Um, um, are the only animals that have um, accessibility mm -hmm. to go into places. Mm -hmm. Emotional support animals do not. Mm -hmm. Emotional support animals can get HUD vouchers, um, like you said, from a prescribed, um, from a mental health professional that says that they can live with the person if they have a mental health diagnosis, mm -hmm. but they do not have full access to um, go into stores or anything like that. Could I offer another distinction between ESAs and pets? Yes. Um, from what from what I'm hearing too, it's it's like a pet. You know, they might be comforting. They might come to you and like you know lay their head on your knee or be with you when you need them. But they still, when they're done, they're done. Like they're still gonna do their own thing. Versus, I feel like an ESA. They still have that, like my cat Courtney. I, um, I do have uh, my my. What do you call that? My GP. There we go. Uh, my GP did write a note, so she's 
claimed as an emotional support animal. And the reason I'm okay with that is because, like, she she will, you know, she will come when I call her, which is kind of awesome. And she oh. will, yeah, she's she's an incredible cat. Um, if I drop something, she'll go find it. She'll, like, walk to mm -hmm. it so I can find it. Um, she'll do certain, and if I'm, I remember the first night we got her, I, I had a PTSD nightmare that night, and she came and, you know, sat with me and purred. So I guess one difference I'm hearing is, like, an emotional support animal might be more attentive. Yes. And more willing to stick by you until it's over versus a pet might be a little more aloof, uh, aloof or even more, uh, I guess, free-spirited is the word I'm looking for. My daughter also has a cat that's an ESA and is very attentive to her. So I think you're right, JJ. I think that might be. And I, I was talking to a friend about this recently because she's trying to find housing, and I was like, could you claim your dog as an ESA? And she's like, no, because my dog does is nothing like Courtney, like doesn't, <laughs> you know, she does her own thing. And so I guess that might hmm. be a distinction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm really thinking about the general public here when I say this, because I feel like that line is not always very clear. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people will be like, oh, it's my ESA, but then you have a dog running around, not, not really being attentive. I think it's very important that the public be educated about the difference Absolutely. and the distinction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, JJ. Um, okay. So um, I think we're coming to the close of our discussion. Does anyone have any last minute thoughts? Like burning desires is what we call it. <laughs> any thoughts? Anything you want to get off your chest? Any thoughts about this experience? Great. Mm -hmm. yeah, this has been fantastic. fantastic. I yeah. think this needs to be more commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Showing people that there are different ways to access help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether it's from a, a mental health professional or someone who works with an animal, both. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's help out there, guys. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, Tracy, there, there's one question that you shared with me beforehand, um, and Michael's kind of alluding to it. Breaking down those social stigmas and those social barriers. Okay, you want to speak on that real to, quick? Sure, to mental health. and. Uh, um, you know, I think I've noticed in, in our society, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm, well, no, I'd say in our society, kind of on maybe a global level, um, we're becoming more informed about mental well-being and mental mental health and trauma work. Um, but I, I think what really draws me to peer support work um, is again, it's, it is that lived experience. And when we have panels like this, it's saying, you're not alone. And, and like Michael's saying, there is help. There are so many avenues out there to get help. And I feel like a lot of people still think, oh, I, I can only get a therapist and it's gonna cost me you know, an arm and a leg. <laughs> or I can only you know, do this or that. And, and I guess panels like this and, and discussions like this keep Keep the water flowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep mm -hmm. the water flowing that, that, again, says, oh, I'm not alone, and I'm going to be okay. And I think that's, that's what we need more than anything in, in the world. Thank you, JJ. And there's more shame in asking for help, and I think then it doesn't matter um, on what level that is or what experience you've had. Or it, you, know, you have to be vulnerable enough and make yourself vulnerable enough to ask for help. And, and realize there are safe people out there, um, safe animals out there who um, will make your experience of opening up feel like you did the right thing. And I think you guys are all providing that, which is wonderful. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming. Mm. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank if you. anyone out thank there you. is <coughs> interested in Rise Phoenix Rise and what we do, here's our information. You can access us at our website, which is risephoenixrise.org. You can um, get our QR code or call us at 303-652-0468. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>